for the person below me that I'm managing, they have to know that I have their hand and I'm bringing them up with, and that Gary's bringing me up. And then through that, we're all going up to achieve the goal that we want to achieve uh, as a company and as individuals. Too many times people try to go around the hands or not believe in the hand. And as long as you guys can be confident and have the uh, radical candor, the amount of trust and truthfulness in each other to really go there like, yo, I'm gonna do this for you. You gotta work on your job, I'm gonna do my job, and then we're gonna win together. Hello, my name is Aaron Wexler, and welcome to another episode of Within the Game. Let's go. Within the Game is all about how to treat your craft and your life like a game so that you can stay inspired, have more fun, be the best version of yourself, create better results, lift up everyone around you and, and find fulfillment both in and out of your game. Today's guest is the one and only Andy Cranek. Andy, thank you so much for having uh, for being here on the show, man. Appreciate it. Uh, pleasure, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me here. Andy serves as the president of VFriends, an intellectual property company built through NFT technology that is one of the world's top projects created by its chairman, Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary V. VFriends has amassed more than $240 million since its launch in May of 2021. And one of the goals for VFriends, which I really liked, is, is to make positive traits like kindness, happiness, and gratitude cool. Throughout his years working as an intern for Gary, running his personal brand, he created the ability to bridge Web 2 to Web 3, and he now keenly understands how to leverage blockchain technology to provide value to audiences through content, storytelling, and utility. Let's go. A graduate of Virginia Tech, Andy gives uh, gives away all his best advice on his IG, at Cranek. Andy, man, I really appreciate you being here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get right into this NFT talk. But before we do that, man, the whole theme of this show is about how to stay inspired. So the whole idea of inspired living, man, what does that mean to you? It means everything to me. You know, I think uh, to be inspired means you're fulfilled and you have a purpose and direction. And I think uh, ideally are have happiness and I think you need to have purpose and direction and be inspired to really fulfilled and have happiness so I think that's where it starts and ends absolutely man and you know when I started this project this podcast back in the pandemic I'm, I'm such a student of Gary V man not I mean a fan for sure but such a student and that's why I reached out to your team because I just want to connect and I see this whole landscape just coming alive right now with this NFT landscape and this blockchain landscape and this really this content creation <clears throat> and content loop landscape. So I was hoping you could um, just take a minute and just kind of explain V friends and um, just this whole concept of this NFT marketplace that we're in right now to my audience, which is mostly athletes and entrepreneurs. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll start with, you know, sort of what is V friends V friends. Um, is an intellectual property company that was birthed and created first as an NFT. You know, our purpose at VFriends is to inspire people uh, with the emotional traits and qualities of the VFriends characters. Yeah. Grabs of Gorilla, Caring Camel, Genuine Giraffe. You know, the traits and attributes that uh, led Gary, Gary B, Gary Vaynerchuk to be the man that he is today. And we launched VFriends first and foremost as a, an NFT project and intellectual property on the blockchain because it allowed us to do unique utilities that wouldn't be possible without that. For example, VCon is an annual conference that in order to attend or to first get the ticket issued to, you have to own a VFriends NFT, a VFriends Series 1 NFT. Um, and it allows for other really cool community membership type activities where we can uh, utilize blockchain technology to just really try to drive value and fun to the community who's also holding our tokens and really uh, espouse the traits of the Be Friends characters. Yeah, man. Yeah. No, it's really interesting as we move into this Web3 world, which we'll, we'll talk about, um, just to kind of see how this is all unfolding and see the utility, right? Because when I think of NFTs, and I think what a lot of people think of is this, this idea of collectibles, this idea of art and digital art, right? But now what you're talking about and, and what a lot of people are talking about, I'm also in the Discord, uh, I'm, I'm watching that go on as well, um, the Be Friends Discord, is this idea of utility and and use case, different use cases, right? And especially for sports, which is my background, 
actually, I was going to ask you if you could um, explain the idea of tokens, um, kind of from a, a, a basic standpoint, and maybe use the the analogy of the Uber token that you talked about in a recent podcast I heard. Well, yeah, so like, and I actually, this is from another podcast that I heard, and I really like the analogy of just explaining Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. Web 1 was the democratization of information, the information superhighway. Back in the day, you know, what was it that in Carta, they used to send CDs in the mail where all of a sudden <laughs> you had to go to the encyclopedia. Yeah. You know, like, want, want to learn something? Google it. You could get information at your fingertips. Yeah. What a profound concept that was when it, the internet first started bubbling and people were going to Netscape and all that. Web 2 was the evolution of now everyone's a publisher. No longer did you just need to go to the three or four encyclopedias that were on the internet that had an abundance of information. I could go to Aaron Wexler's podcast and get just as much information. So the, the ability to uh, publish and the democratization of, of publishing. And Web 3 is, I would say, we're not even in the first quarter. It's in, in, in its infancy, but it's shaping out to become, and I believe will continue to evolve to become the democratization of ownership. Right. And the Uber example is, imagine if Uber was born 10 years later uh, in 2033, and Web3 is further along, whereby Uber and the people that first created or started using the app rather to call the car and, and get from place to place while Uber was trying to market and grow to the scale that it is today. This episode is brought to you by the Design a Future newsletter. It's a free newsletter released every Saturday for entrepreneurs and content creators to become the healthiest, wealthiest version of themselves made by editor-in-chief for this podcast, Ollie Thorpe. It takes five minutes to read and definitely worth signing up. Click the first link in my description to join today. Those first early adopters could be issued tokens uh, as they took on their, their ride sharing and then take part in ownership and growth of the company. Right. You know, and there's a lot of regulation that will need to come in place in order for that to happen, which I think generally I'm really excited for. I think the crypto space needs more regulation because I think that will bring more adoption and clarity uh, to everyone who's a little bit wary of it. But it, sure. it's exciting if you think about how other companies can utilize it to grow more brand and ambassadorship and just market their products. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's really, um, it, for me, you know, someone who's, I, I'd call myself a beginner in this whole space. It, it provides a, an, like a light bulb moment, like, oh, because that, what that is to me is incentive based, right? Oh, I actually want to collect those tokens, right? Because there's going to be incentives down the line for me. And then relating this to sports, right? Because that's kind of what I'd like to uh, see if we can make this relatable to athletes and sports. I really like the idea of uh, tickets, NFTs as tickets to enter a game, right? And then maybe perhaps there's a there's a token. So as, a, as a sports fan myself, I don't know when. I do think it's just a matter of time, though. I get so excited thinking about, you know, going to an NBA game. NBA finals game, NBA playoffs game, and the ticket to the arena inside the arena is an NFT. Right. And then uh, it's a game winner. That game right. that is as memorable, iconic of a shot he has in his career. That ticket NFT is now a valuable collectible forever. Right. You know, as, as a holder who wins that game, I could sell it. I could have a, a, as a collectible momentum. Or, uh, meanwhile the NBA and the teams, it's an additional source of revenue because they can get licensing royalties off of the secondary sales of that ticket in NFC. So, so build on that secondary, right? The derivative effect, right? Like the, re, the, the residual effect. And I think it goes to perpetuity if it's written in the smart contract, right? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so there's been a lot of evolutions of what's happening right now with the smart contracts and royalties. Mm -hmm. People may or may not have seen that uh, there's more, more and more marketplaces popping up right now that actually don't require to mandate the royalties that are being set or just said within the smart contract. There's hmm. work that needs to be uh, developed further in the smart contracts to really mandate that it's being followed. Right now, it's almost just like 
uh, a legal statement that says this is what the royalties are, but it will evolve where no NFTs will be able to leave that wallet or contract unless a creator of royalty is paid. So it, it's a big proponent as to why artists, uh, music artists, people in the creative space are excited by the, the technology because it allows them to maximize uh, revenue and profits off of their work forever. Absolutely. Um, I think this conversation is relatable to anyone in any industry right now. And I, I actually want to move into this idea of uh, attention, right? Because Gary really taught me about this, you know, uh, and, and then you you talk a lot about NFTs as underpriced attention. Please expand on that. What, what does that really mean? Yeah, I've, I've been, a, as have you, I've, I've been a game of, of Gary's attention graph for a long time, you know, and I think in society, there's always underpriced attention because it takes the mass market time to move to the places where people are actually really consuming media and content uh, at scale. You know, early TikTok, early Twitter, early YouTube shorts, when YouTube shorts came out maybe a year ago, if you really wanted to grow this podcast, it would have been the singular best way to do so. And I still think it's probably underpriced in the world of how could I grow this podcast, I would say, like, get very, very serious about YouTube shorts. Right. Um, but it, it's really just maximizing where people are spending their time and how you can storytell and create content for that. Clearly, right now, there's tons of awareness on Web3 and NFTs. And, and I think if you have the right thoughtful approach, which is still authentic to you and native to you, it's a great opportunity to dip your toes and try to storytell and learn more and, and build awareness around your brand. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I really, really resonate with how Gary talks about attention is the new currency, right? And I think that's that's what you're saying, that how NFTs are going to play into that, you know? And, and, and well, it's, it's the balance. Attention is the new currency, but oftentimes people do that while risking their brand or their reputation or being genuine to, and authentic to the things that they know and the things they're capable of. Meaning like don't run into web three because the tension is there. If you don't actually understand the ways that you're going to use and operate it, you know, right, otherwise right. you might be able to do it for a quick second, but you got to think specifically for attention and branding for a long-term play of like, okay, it's there right now. Now, what does it mean to me and how can I play in it? Whether you mm. sell pickles or you inspire athletes or you're an entrepreneur. And that's huge, right? That's huge for anyone in any, in, in any industry. Right. Because everyone's vying for attention right now, whatever they're doing right in any kind of industry. Right. So if they can get if they, if they can grasp what you just said about this idea of uh, attention as currency, but using the NFT to kind of monetize that attention. Right. I think that's what yeah, he's right. trying to say. hundred percent. Well, it's maximizing the attention in a way that's native to you. Like I think Web3 and NFTs are going to impact every industry. Yeah. It's it's going to take some time for the tech to get there from a consumer facing standpoint. Uh, but then also for people to just get creative about how they want to use it. So for like, if right. I was doing the Inspired Athlete podcast and I had a group <laughs> of people that I just wanted to continually inspire, I might just airdrop them or send them NFTs if they met a certain level of commitments to their workout routine or something else that would just be like uh you know I, I i talk about like laying bricks and like a brick a day you know like rome wasn't built in a day people focus too much on how the building how big the building is going to be and what it looks like and what it's going to feel like when they're there versus like just waking up every day and going to the gym and getting your reps in right and so you could do like a whole play on just like how do you motivate people with blockchain technology Okay, did you do your workout? Boom, you're gonna get this momentum of like you got that workout in. Here it is. And that could be the feeling of like, fuck, I gotta go. Yeah. So this whole idea of attention, it's really interesting to me. Um, because uh, like I said, like we were just talking about, it affects everyone. And th this whole thing, this whole topic that we're talking about is a game, right? Talk a little bit about how this is all a game and how it's constantly evolving every single day. The rules keep kind of shifting. Um I mean, I, I think everyone can understand and grasp how quickly things are evolving and changing on a daily basis in the current climate. But specifically with social media and web two apps, like it's still happening. Twitter, 
uh, is a completely different company than it was six months ago. And <laughs> right. Twitter, one of the largest platforms on the planet. Right. And it's continually updating. Like I would say over the next two, three, four, five, six weeks, there's going to be algorithmic changes, uh, different ways the platform is behaving, different content features, where if you're really in it and playing and testing and learning, then you'll, you'll be able to maximize a whole different strategy and, and probably garner new audiences and new attention. I think about it as like test, put out, hey, I'm gonna put out this content in this form for this reason, analyze what happened, and then you'll have your results to then better impact the next post you do. But that's why it's at some level all about at bats. You might've heard like Gary says, imperfection is a disguise for insecurities. And I think to a degree, that's definitely true. Like the best way to learn is by doing for sure with content. So you just got to get better with reps. Like I'm sure this podcast, how you think about producing it, how do you think about getting the best answers out of a guest? You've just gotten better over time. Yeah. And instead of like going to the whiteboard and drawing, like this is how I think it's going to go. You, at some point you just got to hit publish and record. Man. See, I, I love your guys' approach, right? Uh, the V Friends approach, but the whole Gary V brand approach is this integration of like personal growth and tech and marketing, right? I've heard you talk all kinds of times about test, learn, optimize when it comes to marketing, which again, relates to anyone in any industry. But I would I was hoping you could get into some of the EQ stuff. I'm really interested in that, the emotion, emotional intelligence stuff, uh, the self-awareness. I know Gary's big on that. Um, following your heart, the power of a dream. Talk a little bit about that and how you integrate that in, in your, your company's goals. I mean, it's really interesting, right? Like I can't make a lot of that stuff. I think is is personality based and very individually based. I think employees all have different ambitions and as, as a leader and a boss to the company as president of the company, I just try to understand what motivates people want. Uh, makes people tick yeah. and then be understanding and empathetic to that that might change tomorrow and that's cool you know um with that said i think v friends in and of itself represents all of these traits so i feel in an even more immense weight in my current role and position at the company to make sure that my company operates with those traits that we are empathetic and that we are kind and that we are curious and that we really take care of each other while also trying to build one of the biggest IPs in history. And I think that's just so attractive, right? Not just for fans, but for other entrepreneurs and other business leaders who are working on their businesses, like, like myself, like, you know, to have the, the, the trait of happiness, gratitude, empathy, kindness, like those things are just at the core value of who I am as a person. And it just kind of relates to all this other stuff when it comes to marketing and NFT, uh, sorry, NFT, NFT, actually, that's a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> uh, and even blockchain integration, right? Like how I start to implement those things or start to vision those things. I want to keep those core values first, right? So that all those other things are a reflection of those core values. I, I really like how you guys do that. I, I think the magic is pulling from both, both sides, opposite spectrums. How do you be hardworking and patient? Yeah. How do you be extremely confident and extremely humble? Right. You know, they're very, very contradictory. And, and Gary is the, is the best walking living version I've ever seen of, of being in contradiction while going full steam in both directions. But I, I think that is the magic in, in finding the balance of, of how to deploy both those traits, which at times might seem counterintuitive or op opposite. But if you come from the right place, you, you can be grounded in both. Yeah, uh, 100%. I want you to talk a little bit about your, your personal experience as an intern, right? Um, I think it's so powerful to start at a company, especially like Gary's, um, and start as an intern and use this curiosity as a tool, which I've heard you talk about. Would love for you to talk about that, your experience as an intern, how you used your own curiosity, and now what you look for in other interns and other employees. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, honestly, I think you just hit it on the head. My, I tweeted Gary and asked for an internship. And that was arguably the best thing I've done for my professional career, right? It led me to where I am today. And I, I couldn't advise it more for someone who's just getting out of college or is deciding if they want to go to college. I think the value of 
finding a place where someone's going to give you trust to learn, mess up, make mistakes, but really uh, allow yourself to grow uh, is tremendous. And I think curiosity is such an important uh, attribute within those roles because you have to be curious enough to ask yourself questions of like, okay, Aaron told me to do this, but I wonder what happens if I also do this or I present in this, especially in web two and NFTs, because things are changing all the time. You have to be curious enough to want to learn and go down the rabbit hole of like, okay, what is happening on these smart contracts, things of that nature. And, and for me and my growth, it really was just a combination of curiosity and patience and mm. really being dedicated and, and belief. Like, don't, and all the, the only reasons I had all those things also is because I really believed in the person I was working for. Yeah. Like if yeah. I was working for someone that I wasn't so confident in or I didn't feel so great, like maybe he's not going to give me that opportunity or I don't know if I left, he would really still give me another at bat at a different job and give me a really good recommendation, I never would have worked as hard as I did for as long as I did. It was yeah. strictly because I, I could feel that this building was growing and I wanted to be there for when uh, the growth was really happening. It's so cool, man. It's 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 so cool to see how your journey has unfolded. Uh, we're gonna just slightly bounce around a little bit, but talk a little bit about what you learned um, running his personal brand, right? Cause that's what you were doing for for many years, right? hundred percent. Yeah. I think one is I learned a lot about how to think about managing young employees, young junior employees, Yeah. how I would version, how I would manage Andy, the intern, um, and how to do so at a, you know, at a scale of like 20 to 30, uh, person team. And then really just trying to manage Gary, you know, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a weird, uh, relationship where, at the end of the day, it's Gary's brand, you know, and I'm just trying to tee him up for success. Yeah. So he, people are taken aback when they find out that he actually posts on the platforms himself. Like he writes the copy for his Instagram. He actually posts on Instagram. He posts on Twitter. But behind that is a 20 person team trying to tee him up for the best opportunities to tell the stories that he wants to tell. So it's, it's really just trying to like let him shine and always be behind the scenes. And, and then letting everyone else around me try to get their at-bats to connect with Gary and also uh, feel acknowledged for all the hard work they've been doing. Yeah, man. And, you know, now you're, you know, a big time leader. I recently heard, I actually want to take, take your, uh, I, w I would love your take on this. I recently heard this. Um, inspired leadership is the transfer of belief. What does that mean to you? Uh, I couldn't agree more. Inspired leadership, leadership is a transfer of belief. It means in order to be a great leader uh, for those around you, your team, uh, your company, your department, they have to believe in the direction that you want to go. You know, if you want to win the Super Bowl, the people around you have to believe that you guys are capable of winning the Super Bowl. And uh, if, you're, if you can't do that, you're not going to be able to uh, have people believe. So how do you transfer belief? I think it's through not, I think words and communication are paramount, but really it's through actions. I can say all the shit I want about hard work and we're going to go do X, Y, Z and build B friends. But if I don't back it up with the results and actions of the, of the, and the path and process to get there, no one's going to believe. So I think any great leader can transfer beliefs to others. And I think Gary might say all that through content, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, a huge thing that Gary does, which I also think is probably the best way to transfer belief, is trust. That man trusts uh, limit, limitlessly. You know, it, it's up to you to take away the trust. Mm. Like, okay, Aaron, you want to go build the biggest podcast in the world with me? Great, go do it. Yeah. Like I'm here for you in any way you need access, resources, whatever, go Un unlimited trust in your capabilities to do it. And then from there, it's a navigation of like, okay, how well can we communicate together to make sure that you can identify where you need help or how, how I can help you. Too many people uh, lead from fear. I'm going to hold you back because I don't want Aaron to win that much because then he might get more money than me or because then whatever version of insecurities uh, spur up that leads to lack of trust. But really, 
if you can be really, really in tune with the risk that you might have in trusting someone, uh, it's only upside. Yeah. You know, it, it just allows more, it allows for speed and better opportunities. Mm. And for me, like when Gary put his trust in me, there's a fire under my ass. Like I'm like ready to go. You know, I'm like, oh shit, he, he trusts me to do that. That's cool. <laughs> it's almost in reverse where like, I'm just like, ready, ready to go as hard as I can. Love that. Uh, talk a little bit about this idea of one hand up, one hand down. I really, really resonate with that, right? You're reaching up for help here and you're grabbing someone else on saying, come on up this way, right? Talk about that yeah. a little bit. It's like transfer of belief, right? Like I, for the person below me that I'm managing, they have to know that I have their hand and I'm bringing them up with me and that Gary's bringing me up. And then through that, we're all going up to achieve the goal that we want to achieve uh as a company and as individuals you know and, and i think too many too many times people try to go around the hands or not believe in the hand and as long as you guys can be confident uh and have the uh radical candor the amount of trust and truthfulness in each other to really go there like yo i'm gonna do this for you you gotta work on your job i'm gonna do my job and then we're gonna win together love that man Let's get back into some of the NFT stuff. You know, um, one of the keywords in this NFT world is community, right? Building a community. I mentioned I'm in the Discord, um, you know, watching the, the conversations take place. Um, what is the importance of community in this whole landscape? It's the only thing you can't buy. Hmm. Like everyone wants to come to me. How do I start the NFT project? How do I do this? How do I do that? And my biggest advice is don't worry about any of that. Worry about the community mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can pay someone to create a smart contract for you. You can pay a designer to do the NFT artwork for you. There's not a person in the world that you could pay who can garner an audience to give a fuck about an inspired athlete. That's the magic, you know, it, it's, it's, mm. it's the art of all of it. And I think it takes time. It, it takes care and it takes putting the brand in value first. Um, so I would like, if I was going to launch an NFT project with you, the first thing I would do for the next six months is just be in discord, building a community. Is that the yeah, best place? It, 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 maybe I like discord because it's a, it's a unique, it's very difficult to manage, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a really unique opportunity to develop chat behavior, you know, like real back and forth conversations. And right now that is the place where NFT combos are happening. Right. It, it sort of does have a bad brand to some degree because it's overwhelming and people get scanned and all that is true, comma, back to attention. It has a tremendous amount of attention for a room to be communicating and talking to. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering about this idea of community and like big brands again, in my sports world, which is like the NBA, the NFL, like these big leagues, right? They, like, where, where are those communities? Are those being built on YouTube? Seems like there's a lot of action on YouTube lately. Um, you know, for, for those things that maybe the NFT world yeah, hasn't yeah. been, you know, penetrated yet. Yeah, I mean, I, they're on every platform where the people would talk about sports, right? Yeah, I think yeah. Like YouTube is a huge one. Um, communities are being built all over the, all over platforms. And I think it just comes back to whoever the head of the community is or, or the leader of the brand, what they feel is the most native room for them and for their community. Yeah. It could just be like, yo, I'm on YouTube 24 seven. I'm in YouTube comments, all that. And that's where I want to build the community. Cause I feel like that's where the largest audience of basketball fans are, you know? Right, 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 right. Let's talk a little bit about social media advertising. It's kind of like, uh, again, relatable to anyone in any industry, right? I've heard you talk about the TikTokification. I was hoping you could break that down for my audience a little bit, the interest graph versus the IG people graph. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like TikTok to me really, really took off because you could for the first time go viral and because you were one piece of content away from being famous. Yeah. In, in, in a way that no other platform ha had been. And then with that, 
uh, it also really, really expanded upon the long tail of interest. If you really just want to be known as the single best banana pudding brand in the world, <laughs> you can do that. Be the banana pudding guy and just make TikToks every day talking about banana pudding. Um, and that's only going to continue. And this is something that Gary was talking about in his first book, Crush It. I think in like 2011 was when he wrote it. And people said he's like joking. Nobody's going to make YouTube money talking about being the smurf guy but you, you totally can and i think it's just long tail of interest we're like i'm not going to just go to like someone someone who talks about desserts if i want to know about banana pudding i'm going to go to the banana pudding guy on tiktok who talks about it every single day and it's like a real real expert in that lane yes um can you mention some of the other platforms you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, what, what's going on? What's the future with all those platforms when it comes to the NFT game? Um, so to win in Web3 right now, you need to be winning in Web2 too, because you need yeah. the awareness. Like you really need to be able to market, build a community, uh, generate demand and awareness for what you're doing in Web3 for NFTs. Again, every, you can think about it, what comes most natural to you and I would, what's the number one platform in terms of attention for you based on whatever your format is, whatever storytelling you're going to do, how you're going to garner the biggest reach of humans interested in, in what you're talking about. It could be Facebook. It could be Instagram. It could be Twitter. It could be TikTok. Um, it could be YouTube. I would generally say right now, just based on numbers alone, TikTok is still number one. It, like if you don't have a TikTok strategy and you're really trying to grow a brand, you're vulnerable in a big, big way. So I, I think of it as like 80, TikTok is my orange and I got to squeeze that orange for as much as possible, 110%. Meanwhile, I still have to have a presence on every platform. So when TikTok is no longer my main orange, I can replace it with one of the other fruits I have on the periphery and that becomes my main orange. I'm trying to squeeze all the juice out of and is I agree with you. And is TikTok expanding expanding more into long form content? Yeah, I mean, all the platforms have the same dynamics, right? Like yeah. live, long form, and there's been some. I uh, I'll give you a hot take. I don't know. The longevity of of TikTok, I think, is more vulnerable than people think. What do you mean? I think it. I mean, you remember back in the day when it was there's talks of it getting banned. Yeah, I think that those talks are still on the table. Why? Uh, because of all the data collection. Yeah. 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 I. I mean, th th honestly, there. I. I had a whole section on fear here. Like, there's a there's a whole fear part of this whole game right that we didn't really get into maybe we should talk about that because you mentioned this this data collection right i mean they're doing that anyway right data collection is already they're, happening they're doing it anyway but tiktok is different because it's it's, it's really a chinese company right it's owned right China. right and so it becomes social political issues like how do right. you know about that right you know, and for the most part i think everyone generally doesn't care obviously yeah Right. Yeah. And, and I think like we talk about privacy and all that. And I think that ship has way sailed. People have different opinions on it. But like, for instance, the this is going left field, but uh, Snowden came out, said what he said, and no one really blinked an eye. Like a lot of the things that he said were validated as truths, which are pretty staggered, which is like staggering information. But no one really, really cared. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, but still people are fearful. But if you watch our reactions, we're, we seem to be doing fine. And we have so much abundance of wealth and health and opportunities that I think generally everything is trending in a good direction. Yeah, right. Uh, what about the FTX thing recently happened that happened in the news? I mean, and 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 before you answer, like from my perspective, I think it's going to come and go, and I think it, what's going to happen is there's going to be probably more of those things. That, but in the long run, the blockchain will a hundred percent be a part of Web three. Your take? Yeah. <laughs> um, couldn't have been a worse story. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That was like the worst story that ever could have happened for the space. And it's like shocking, you know, and, and I'm, I feel bad for it really impacted people, you know, like I, I was worried. I know friends lost money. I, I've yeah. heard stories of other people that lost a lot. And I just was like worried about them and their mental health, but yeah, it just sucks. But I, I think overall, hopefully again, it just brings more scrutiny, more regulation, which I think will be good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a few, a few more things here, Andy. Um, I was listening to you and Maha speak about this, this idea of web three integration. Let's talk about web three integration, right? Because there was one, um, I think she mentioned, you know, how passports or, or even tickets for, you know, airplane tickets are all on your phone now, right? Like it's very, very rare that you have a paper ticket. Now everything's kind of just like scanned through your phone. I think that's kind of the start of this whole idea of like an NFT as a ticket to get somewhere or to get access to something, right? Like, can you expand a little bit on that, on that, that example of travel and passport, but it's all on your phone and it's somehow integrated on the blockchain? Yeah. Well, before I go there, let's just take like a Rolex. Sure. Oh yeah. To well, authentication. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Not good. So like, if you have a Rolex right now, if you want, you want to verify that Rolex is real, they have like a heavy credit card plastic, like, Hey, this is how you know it's real. You can still fake that plastic, right? What you can't fake is a digital NFT asset that you know that it has to live on this contract and have come from this address to be a Rolex. And that's like the digital combination of, of authenticity. And I think that's where it could go with travel and passports and things of that nature, where it's your ticket, they're scanning it, and they know it's real in a second because it's on the blockchain and that blockchain's the one that's verifiably accurate. Okay. Yeah. And just take a minute to talk about AI and VR. Crazy. How is that? How's that going to play a role? If I mean, <laughs> over the weekends, I'll have fun. I go to chat GBT and I'm never uh, not blown away by what's, what's currently happening that I, that I don't think people understand yet and what's going to happen over the next three, four, five years. Like the implications for education from K through 12 were wild. Same with college and like people are, are banning it, which I understand, but I don't agree with. So how do you create policies that are conducive to using it, but still garnering the students understanding and strength? Um, it's a challenging time, but I think it always has to be offense because defense, mm. it always has to be offense, you know, and because that's the truth. Wow. So, so how do you build strategies for offense while also doing the most important thing, which is like the mindset, like the phone, the tech, Nipsey Hussle said this to Gary, and I always refer back to it. The technical logic, technological revolution happened before the psychological revolution. The phone changed the world. And we just haven't yet been able to parent our kids or ourselves for how to set the policies for mental health and how do you separate yourself from all the noise and all that. Like phones aren't bad. We just need to level up our mindsets on how to incorporate it in our daily lives while still being healthy, happy humans. Man. Andy, dude, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, before I let you go, just do a quick promo for V Friends. How can people support? How, you know, what, what's the best way Man, to get in? The best way to support is just check us out on, on social media, follow us on Instagram, check us out on, on Twitter, see what we're about, join our discord. Um, if you're never new, if you don't know anything about NFTs, I'm telling you to be friends community is as friendly and welcoming as any community there is. Yeah. You don't have to own an NFT. If you're about positivity and optimism and hard work, we got yeah. a place for you to be friends. I love it, man. I love it. Andy, I really appreciate your time. Everyone out there, peace, blessings, and stay inspired y'all. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.